Aaron Ashton. I'm a, a consultant for Hodges Burnson and delighted to be talking to Maya Dingra today, a senior business leader for Hewlett Packard in their education business. Um, we've been speaking about the developments, the trends in e-learning, and I want to delve a little deeper now, Maya, and can say to you, oh, people came into schools, universities, came into this period of, of remote learning in different positions. Some institutions, of course, would have had a strategy for e-learning, would have been developing it over a number of years. Others, this would have been a defensive play that have had to have put in their remote learning very quickly. And everyone's done a, a, an excellent job from different positions. But when they come out the other end, I think almost every institution is going to be looking at their strategy, looking to review it and looking to, to develop that e-learning framework. So this seems like a really good opportunity to ask you, what advice would you give if somebody wanted to look at their e-learning framework? How, how should they go about it? I think step one is to really assess what's happening, right? And I think you need to assess it on three parameters. So any ministry, government uh, institution that is looking at the space needs to start taking uh, a calibration or, or a stock of what is happening in terms of, you know, uh, access. And when I say access, you need, you need to define, you know, what's, what level of devices do your students have, right? Uh, does everybody have a device or not? Or how can you make them have a device very soon? Uh, and sometimes a device might mean uh, a mobile phone or a smartphone, right? Because you can access e-learning on that as well. The second is the internet coverage. So, you know, what is the level of coverage that I have in my area? You know, if I'm in a mature economy, yes, all my students is a given have uh, internet coverage. But if I'm not, you know, if I'm in an emerging market, what is the level of internet co coverage I, I have today? And the third part is, you know, digitized content. So, you know, if, if I, even if I have access and even if I have the internet coverage and the devices, uh, you know, do I have content which is digitized and uh, which can be made available to the students? So this is really about the access part, right? You need to take stock of that. Then you need to take stock of what's happening with your tools. So if you have uh, digitized content, do you have a repository for it? You know, do you have a digital room, a digital library where you, where you can uh, keep that? Uh, you know, what kind of collaboration tools do you have in place, right? In some places that might mean Zoom, in some places it might mean Telegram or WhatsApp, right? So, so what do you have in, in that uh, context? And, and then, you know, comes all the functionality of what happens in a class, right? From, e, from assessment to, you know, grading to attendance. So do you have solutions which can recreate all of that for you within the class, uh, within the virtual class now? So how do you create a virtual classroom? And you can do this with disparate e-learning solutions, or you can have a proper learning management solution which binds all of this together, right? So, so that's the second part, right? And the third part is really the capability, right? So what is the capability of, uh, you know, your, your teachers to take on digital pedagogy? Are they ready for it? Do they need to be sort of equipped uh, immediately? Students as well, you know, are they adapt, able to adapt to this? You know, are they ready for this? Or, or do you need to do some uh, groundwork for, for, for them? And what is the governance structure in place? Because, you know, how are you going to assure the quality that you have promised at the start of the year and how are you going to measure it? So, you know, you need to have that as, as well sorted out. So when you take stock of all these three sort of attributes, you know, then in terms of capability, tools and access, then you can start putting the way forward. And the immediate way forward would be, you know, what is the rapid response? In, within my context, within my circumstances, what all can I deploy and what impact can I make for at least a certain part of my audience? Because very often what we do is that we say that we shouldn't leave any child behind. But in leaving no child behind, we sometimes leave every child behind. So you can't go in with that strategy because you do the greatest wrongs when two rights clash. And you can't be doing the wrong to the kid who can actually access it. So you need to have the rapid deployment of what is possible within your circumstances. But immediately or in parallel, it needs to be an assessment and improvement program as well. You know, assess what your impact you're being able to create and then, you know, improve on that. So it becomes sort of a living model, which is recreating itself and, and making more and more Im impact. The third phase is to really record that impact and record the gap against what you wanted to achieve or what is ideal, right? So you do that gap analysis and then you put a strategy forward in terms of going back to school as well, because you can't just leave e-learning in that vacuum because you are going to go back to a brick and mortar school. So what is school going to look like tomorrow, right? What is a blended approach you're going to take? So that strategy as well. So those will be the three phases of deploying all of this, which you have taken stock of. But to me, that's the way forward. Thank you. Fascinating to hear you talk. And my guess, I could be wrong, but my guess is that students would embrace this quite readily because after all, it does reflect the way they live their lives, doesn't it, in terms of, of, of online. So I don't sense any challenge there. In terms of teachers, 
as you say, perhaps a blended approach is the way forward. And I don't think anyone is suggesting that we're going to abandon physical teaching. Uh, if anything, I think this period of remote uh, teaching, remote learning has showed us even more the centrality of, of, of the importance of that relationship between the teacher and the student or the, or the lecturer and the student. But in terms of this blended approach, this may well be the sort of the, the future of education. So where would you look if we accept the fact that, that the future may be a, a blend of physical teaching, online teaching, and we should look for best practice now, where would you advise people look to get that best practice, that idea, how, who, who's doing it really well? How do we embrace the best this blended approach has to offer? I mean, you said it yourself, Aaron, it's a digital world, right? So we are going to blend the physical and digital world, and we're going to be living in the era of experiences. So, you know, we need to look at people who have mastered this hybrid world. And, you know, retailers are probably some of the best examples of having done this well, especially the large ones, because they are now able to create this whole omni-channel experience where no matter which world you're interacting with them, and no matter how much time you transition or interview through these worlds, your experience is the same. And that is what needs to be recreated for the students as well. And I think there are a few elements that you really need to keep in, in consideration when you're uh, sort of taking the best practices from there and trying to recreate that digital world. So I, I think, you know, you need to look at the product per se, you know, because the product needs to now be able to be consumed in the digital as well as the physical world in, in the same way. And it needs to be accessible and it needs to be equitable distribution. So, you know, the universities or, you know, the, the schools need to get that right in terms of the product, right? The second is the price, because there is this whole perception that you're not getting in proportion what you're paying for. So the, the price has to become proportionate to what is being given to you as quality and as a product. So the, the, whole, the whole proportion of price and the recalibration of price has to be taken into account. I think the third is personalization, because like I said earlier, uh, we are going to be living in a uber personalized world. It is going to be about the power of one. And to that individual, to that student, you know, how does this particular course, how does particular content make sense and how is it the best way for to be delivered to that student and, and ingested by that student. So that's going to be, you know, the, the third part of it. And, and anybody who deals with customer experience, and I say customer experience and the fact that it should be a student experience, uh, becomes about effort and ease. So, you know, you measure effort and ease now. So, you know, what is the ease which the student is having in accessing your content, in accessing you, uh, in going through that whole journey of going through the program, the course, and then getting assessed on it and so on. So what is the effort score there, right? And, and that needs to uh, be something else that we very uh, clearly need to be cognizant of as educators, as uh, you know, people who are in the education field. There, of course, are other elements like you know, uh, time, because time is going to be such a, a commodity in demand that you know, how do you compress now these modules? And like I talked about micro-credentialing, so how do you create micro-credentials? How do you let uh, students self-pace themselves, right? So that flexibility of time is going to be a key factor going forward, followed by transparency, because I don't think uh, education has been a very transparent business as far as the student is concerned, right? They walk into a university or they walk into school, not knowing completely what they're going to get. And I think the whole transparency uh, level has to increase. And, and it has to increase because finally trust is going to be the currency that this is all going to be, is going to be the de facto currency on which this is going to get transacted on. So, you know, as the physical world disappears or, you know, evaporates, it's going to get replaced by trust. And for trust, transparency needs to already be there. So eventually, if you're going to be looking at trust, then all these other six, seven things which I said need to start falling in place for that final element to, you know, click in place. So, so that's really the best practices I think we need to be absorbing from people who have mastered this um, hybrid world of physical and digital. Thank you. That, that's really interesting. When you're hearing you talk, some of the principles that you're, that you're espousing, some of the principles you're talking about in terms of personalization of learning, they're, they're, they're time honored. I, think, I don't think anybody would challenge those. It's interesting to hear how a new technology can help realize principles that have, that have been important to education for a very long time. You also mentioned time, and unfortunately time has defeated us today. We've run out of time. All that remains is for me to say thank you very much for giving me your time, for talking about the, about the trends that you're picking up. Absolutely fascinating. And um, as you said at the start of this conversation, this really is exciting, interesting times for education. Thank you, Aaron.